World War I might have signaled the dawn of a true revolution in military hardware, but it was still filled with some of the craziest and weirdest weapons ever seen on the battlefield. And one American weapon was so terrifying that Germany threatened to execute any POW discovered with it. Tsar Tank, Russian Empire. Our first weird weapon of World War I never actually made it to the battlefield, but it was so weird and would have been so terrifying that it deserves a mention. In the years before World War I, militaries around the world were starting to put the internal combustion engine to the test in an attempt to develop awesome new weapons of military might. Russian engineer Nikolai Lebedenko, however, might have had the absolute craziest idea of them all. In essence, Lebedenko invented the Ferris wheel from hell, a massive tank far outsizing even the largest tanks of World War II, which instead of using tracks, was driven by two massive wheels, with a third smaller wheel to stabilize it in the rear. The idea first got the attention of the Russian Tsar when Lebedenko made a tiny prototype with a spring motor, which he wound and then let loose in front of several thick books. The tiny tank managed to climb the books with ease, thoroughly impressing the Russian leader. Almost immediately, he authorized the equivalent of tens of millions of dollars for research and development. In theory, the Tsar tank solved the problem of trying to move a vehicle through a battlefield with a brilliantly simple solution. Make wheels big enough that they can climb over any obstacle. Thus, the tank had two massive wheels out in front extending off two separate arms. In the rear, a third arm ended in a much smaller wheel which would help stabilize the vehicle. The body of the tank would be thin and vertical much unlike anything we might think of as resembling a traditional tank, and would have multiple levels where soldiers could fire cannons and machine guns. With the Tsar's funding, the Russian army built a single prototype in 1914. Two 250 horsepower engines powered each of the massive wheels, but all that power was delivered very inefficiently to the wheels, resulting in a loss of capability. More critically, however, was the miscalculation concerning the rear unpowered wheel. Because of the way weight was distributed on the massive tank, the rear wheel ended up bearing too much of the vehicle's weight, which resulted in it frequently becoming stuck. Even more practical concerns plagued the prototype though, such as the fact that the tank crew's fields of fire were severely limited by the dual massive wheels out in front of the vehicle, which were themselves extremely vulnerable to being damaged by enemy fire. The prototype saw a single demonstration, during which it became stuck. And just like that, the Russian Ferris wheel from hell was cancelled forever. In our opinion, the Russians should have stuck with it, and instead of arming the thing with machine guns and cannons, they should have just slapped some giant speaker on it and blasted out nightmarish carnival tunes as the massive tanks careened toward enemy soldiers. World War I might have been the only conflict in human history to use weapons and mass that were obsolete for thousands of years though. Trench Raiding Clubs, Allies and Central Powers Sometimes, progress goes in reverse, and nothing attests to the sheer brutality of World War I than the Trench Club, a weapon borrowed straight from the dawn of warfare. The Trench Club was carried by troops conducting nighttime raids on enemy trenches. Because rifles would cause too much noise, those daring raiders needed weapons that could kill quickly and very, very violently. Enter the Trench Club. Literally just that, a club. Soldiers would use them to bash enemy infantry to bits in daring nighttime raids. The goals of these raids was to destroy enemy weapon and supply depots, take prisoners and gather intelligence, rather than a serious attempt to actually take and hold territory. Thus, raiders would ditch their traditional rifles and pistols, which would give them away, and opt for a more brutal way of killing up close and personal, but very quietly. Trench clubs varied in design and were largely ad hoc weapons. Like something out of the 1979's The Warriors, these clubs would be outfitted with spikes and nails driven through them to enhance their lethality. Boards wrapped in barbed wire or simply embedded with random bits of sharpened metal also made for effective trench clubs. The sheer variety of trench clubs was staggering, and some soldiers opted to go full-on Dark Souls and even craft homemade flails complete with spiked balls. Clubs were excellent weapons for brutal trench warfare, but one American weapon was so effective that Germany threatened to execute any American American POW armed with it, the shotgun, USA. Shotguns may seem ubiquitous today, but when Germany came face to face with American troops armed with shotguns, they were so horrified with the results that they'd issued a diplomatic protest against their use. The United States had been using shotguns in combat since 1900, when 200 shotguns were sent to the Philippines to aid US troops in fighting off Moro tribesmen. The Moro warriors would frequently rush American soldiers, forcing them into hand-to-hand -hand combat, where they had the advantage and rifles were largely useless. All that changed with the issuing of the Winchester Model 1897 to US troops. As World War I raged on, American observers kept close tabs on the fighting and quickly learned how brutal trench combat was. They put this knowledge to good use, and when 
When America inevitably joined the fighting, she brought with her soldiers armed with modified Model 1987s, more than ready for savage close quarters combat. These specially modified shotguns had a heat shield that would keep the soldier's hand off the barrel, which would heat up during intense and prolonged firing. An additional modification was to add a bayonet lug on which an M1917 bayonet could be affixed. The barrel was shortened to 20 inches, and soldiers were issued with buckshot ammunition. These trench loads contained nine 00 buckshot pellets, making the Model 1897 a veritable cannon in the tight quarters of European trenches. A modified action which allowed the soldier to keep the trigger depressed while working the action meant that the 1897 could unload its five-round load in rapid succession, which quickly earned it the nickname of the Trench Sweeper. The weapons were so devastatingly effective that Germany soon launched an official diplomatic protest against America, citing the 1907 Hague Convention on Land Warfare, which forbade the use of weapons designed to cause unnecessary suffering. After careful consideration, Judge Advocate General of the Army Secretary of State Robert Lansing decided the law did not apply to American shotguns. The reply enraged the Germans, who threatened to retaliate on any captured American troops found to be wielding shotguns. The U.S. responded by threatening to retaliate in kind against German troops equipped with flamethrowers and serrated bayonets. World War I was largely fought in the trenches, and if you thought trench clubs were insane, wait until you see the next item on our list. Gauntlet Dagger World War I might have been the most peculiar conflict in human history. On one hand, the fruits of the Industrial Revolution had yielded weapons that changed the face of war forever, such as the machine gun and the tank. On the other, the war still often devolved into the most crude and ancient forms of fighting imaginable, and the Gauntlet Dagger is yet another such example. This weapon consisted of a large metal gauntlet that was worn over the wearer's hand and forearm. The sheet metal protected the wielder from enemy knives and bayonets, and inside of the gauntlet itself was a crossbar that the wielder would grip with his hand. A long metal spike protruded from the end of the gauntlet, which would be used to repeatedly stab one's foes. Hooks on the sides of the gauntlet would allow the wearer to lace it up tightly onto their arm, securing it in place even in the heaviest of fighting. While the weapon would prohibit the use of a rifle, it was a devastating close quarters weapon meant to be used in trench raiding. However, if we had our choice of a gauntlet dagger or an American shotgun, we'd gladly take the latter. With the introduction of the airplane, Allied and Central Power Pilots were quick to come up with a very weird but terrifying use for it. Aerial darts, French, Germans, and British. In World War I, the airplane was slowly defining its role on the battlefield. Initially used as an aerial scout, eventually airplanes became armed so they could shoot down other airplanes and enemy airships. Recognizing the potential in a machine that could deliver an explosive payload to the enemy from directly above, airplanes were even fitted with bombs. However, these early airplanes didn't have the power to carry aloft significant loads. The Italians, however, saw a solution to this problem in 1911 and developed the aerial dart, weighing far less than a bomb, an airplane could carry several hundred of these wickedly sharp long metal spikes. Stabilized by everything from small fins to feathers, the darts would be used to saturate an enemy formation. The French were the first to use them in World War I, with canisters full of the darts attached to the underside of an aircraft. The pilot would fly very high over an enemy formation and pull a wire which would open the canister holding the darts. The released darts would then begin to fall from tremendous height, picking up speed and energy as they fell. The result was devastating, as the long thin darts could easily penetrate steel helmets if dropped from high enough, and deliver long, thin wounds that penetrated deep and resulted in severe internal damage. Aerial darts would be equipped by both sides aboard their airplanes and airships, dropped by the thousands over enemy lines. One French pilot alone dropped 18,000 darts in a single day in 1915. However, the darts soon grew out of favor with both the Central and Allied war planners. The biggest problem with the darts was that they were completely unguided, and largely relied on blind luck to actually strike their targets. Because pilots would have to fly at great heights to ensure the darts gained enough speed to become lethal, their accuracy was greatly diminished. Even when used against enemy airships, the darts simply proved ineffective. Their greatest flaw, however, was the fact that the darts needed to score a direct hit to be lethal, as the darts fell with such speed that they'd embed themselves harmlessly into the soil if they missed. Eventually, the darts were phased out, though they were still in limited use in 1917. Necessity is the mother of invention, and the need to not get one's head blown off led to the invention of the weirdest rifles in history. Paris scope rifle, central and allied powers. When World War I began, Germany assumed it would be a brief, bloody conflict. However, both the central and allied powers seriously misunderstood how the machine gun had completely changed the face of war forever. With the ability to put out hundreds of rounds of ammunition a minute, these early machine guns may not have been terribly accurate, but they rarely ever needed to be. Mass infantry charges would be absolutely decimated by machine gun fire, with men cut down in the dozens. Trench warfare was the inevitable result, as the machine
machine gun ground the conflict to all but a complete halt. Troops became stuck in their trenches, unable to undertake any sort of offensive action without overwhelming numbers. The trench war had become so deadly that even lifting one's head up and out of the trench for a quick look could be a good way to get your ticket punched. Both sides employed snipers whose sole job was to demoralize the enemy by taking out any soldier unwary or foolish enough to expose themselves. The periscope rifle was thus quickly developed by inventors on both sides as a way of allowing friendly forces the ability to fire on the enemy without exposing the soldier doing the firing. The rifles varied in design but had very common elements. The rifles would be fitted to a frame of some sort which could be used to prop the weapon up and over the trench. A periscope consisting of a reflective mirror would allow a soldier to look down the weapon's sights even from several feet below. The great weight of the frame also helped to stabilize the weapon, and most rifles would be fitted with specially modified magazines, holding many times more rounds than normal. The weapons were surprisingly effective, and despite their clumsy appearance, could be accurate upwards of a few hundred yards, though modern recreations make it probable that the weapon was only truly accurate up to 100 yards. The weapon was so effective, though, that during the Gallipoli campaign, British forces completely abandoned the use of traditional rifles during the daytime. The inventor of one of the first periscope rifles used by the British was even awarded 100 pounds, about $4,000 in today's currency, after the war by the British War Office for his great contribution to the war effort. The periscope rifle design became so popular that eventually machine guns were modified to operate in a similar manner. Incredibly, even pistols received a trench upgrade, which makes more sense than it might seem at first, considering that sometimes opposing trenches were as close as five yards apart. Now go check out weirdest weapons in the world, or click this other video instead.